welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrea. And I'm Madeline and this is episode 124. Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world as well as some extra snippets like travel, history and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. And we have a really exciting program again for you today and it all centers around the beautiful and famous city of Bath. So Bath was one of our destinations during our recent trip around the UK and both featured guests in today's episode are residents of Bath. So our feature interview is with the illustrator, knitwear designer and recent author Alex Bird. And Alex has Estonian heritage and she shares her knowledge of some of the lesser known traditional Estonian knitting techniques through her book which is called Traditions Revisited Modern Estonian Knits. So Alex has taken around five or six traditional knitting techniques that are typically used in Estonian folk costume designs and she's reinterpreted them into modern wearable garments and she assures us that these techniques are deceptively simple to learn which is fantastic but they all have a significant wow effect and are a lot of fun to do which is also fantastic. So during the interview Alex is wearing her Estonian folk costume and we can clearly see the connection between the traditional use of those techniques and her modern designs. She's really charming. It's a fun interview. I think you'll really love it. Yeah. And our second guest is particularly interesting. We're featuring a historical milliner in our Makers segment. Neil Fortin is a costume designer who found a niche market in Bath creating beautiful, high-quality, historical headwear for reenactors. So previously Neil designed costumes for operas and now he can apply his skills in this new way due to the Jane Austen Festival which is held annually in Bath. I got to do this interview and it was heaps of fun. I got to dress up in the most amazing and extravagant headwear. You sure did. Yeah. <laughs> I was jealous because <laughs> I love dressing up too. But Bath is also one of the most beautiful European cities that I've had the opportunity to visit. And mm. most of its buildings are made from the local honey-coloured or golden-coloured stone. And the dominant architectural style is Georgian. And that's because the city became very fashionable as a spa city and social centre for the upper classes during the 18th century, when most of its fine architecture was built. So Bath features significantly in the Jane Austen novels, and that's why there is an annual Jane Austen festival there. But it also is often used as a setting for modern period films, like the series Bridgerton. It's such a pretty city and we thought you'd love to see it. So we're also including a little tour of Bath, showing you some of the famous sites. On top of that, Madeline and I have brand new knitting projects to share with you. And we also have another pop psychology theme on the difference between learned helplessness and, and strategic incompetence. Yep. And how that can apply to us as knitters. So it's a full program. Let the show begin and we'll start with me in under construction. So I have a new project as I said and I started it right at the end of our UK trip and I'm really embarrassed to tell you that it is yet another Kim Hargraves design. But think of it this way, Kim Hargraves is retiring this year and I'm just celebrating her wonderful contribution to the world of knitting. So the design's called Effie and it comes from her book Ravish which I already had on my bookshelf. And what can I say, it just had my name written on it, so I had to knit it. So here's a picture of it. It uses the Rowan hand knit cotton and the pattern is really not that tricky. It has a reverse stocking stitch eyelet pattern on the sides of the garment and there are vertical columns of a lacy trellis pattern that are bordered with twisted stitches running down the centre of the front and the centre of the back. And the lacy trellis pattern is all over the sleeves as well. So this is what I've done so far, if you can hold it for me. Mm -hmm. It's taken me way longer than I imagined it would and that's because I've just done a series of really stupid mistakes, mainly because I'm just getting very lazy and I'm not reading the pattern properly. So for example, see on the front how it's got, the front has got all of these vertical columns of a lacy trellis pattern here. Well you've got seven on the front and only three on the back. Okay, so in the pattern you knit the back first, which I did, and then it says work the front as given for back up into the asterisk. And I thought, I know how this goes. I'll just do what I did on the back 
and I'll look at the pattern again when it gets up to the front neck shaping. So I'm knitting away and then eventually I realize that my front doesn't look like the pattern's front and more importantly the pattern's front looks much better. So of course I have to rip it all out and start again. So I've just done so many mistakes <laughs> just in that sort of way of doing it. Anyway, so what is interesting about this design is that the fabric turns out to be reversible and I've sewn it up now, but it did take me a while to decide what side of the fabric I liked best. So if you have a look here, the right side of the fabric has the eyelet pattern in reverse stocking stitch, which I'm not that keen on, but the trellis columns stand forward more, which I really do like. Whereas on the reverse side of the fabric, I like the eyelet pattern in stocking stitch much better but the trellis columns recede more and they just don't look quite as interesting as they do on the front. Well, personally, I did prefer the wrong side, actually. Yeah, you like the wrong side. In the end, I just went for the right side because yeah. the trellises, they, they sort of dominate the front. Now, what I found particularly interesting with this design was the shape of the, of the neckline. And I, I couldn't describe what it was, so I looked it up to see what it was. And dressmakers amongst you will know. It's called a Queen Anne neckline. So if you can hold it for me. Mm -hmm. A Queen Anne neckline is where it has a high narrow neck at the back of the bodice and then it opens out to a deep wide neckline at the front of the bodice and it can either go straight across like this in a square neckline or it can sort of be a little bit more like my dress in a what's called a sweetheart. So that's really interesting. I've never done that before. You work the design bottom up and in pieces and after you've cast off the wide square front neck, you work both front shoulders separately. And if you look at the eyelet pattern on the sides here, you can see that the fabric is getting wider as you work your way up to the shoulder seams. I've never done this shaped neckline before and it was really fun to see how it's constructed. So the whole neckline is bordered with garter stitch and on the sides, you work the garter stitch together with the eyelet pattern in the same row. But then when you've cast off for the shoulders, you don't cast off the garter stitch section, but you just continue knitting a panel of garter stitch, which later gets sewn down across the back neck. And that's how you get the garter stitch border to go right around the neckline. So I've put it on for you so you can have a look. It's not quite meant to go over this dress. Don't look down here because it's over this full dress so it's just rolling up. But you can see what it's gonna be like here. I have contemplated for a while on not knitting any sleeves at all, just sort of finishing it off with maybe a I-cord binding or something because I thought it does look quite cute as a sleeveless mm. vest. But then I thought I could also do a little cap sleeve on it and I could mirror what's going on down here. So you can see how Kim's got, this is a very typical design feature for Kim. She's got a few rows of garter stitch and then a two by two rib. So I thought I could do that as a little cap sleeve and do it in short row shaping. So just do a little bit of garter stitch and then obviously in a smaller needle because you, what you really don't want is the sleeve to s sort of stick out like that, yeah. but to lie flat and then do the two by two ribbing around there. So I thought that is possible and it could look cute. But then I decided in the end to do just a little short puff sleeve. So it's going to sit like that. That's really cute. You like that one? Is that garter stitch though? No, that's it looks a, so that's lacy. A it, it is. It's just another trellis pattern okay. all over. So you yeah. like this one better? Yes, I do, definitely. Yeah. Okay, but let me t just point out this stupid mistake. The, I'm just showing you this because then you can have it, get an idea of what it's going to look like. But this cap sleeve does not fit into this armhole. This is another one of my mistakes. I don't know how, what I was doing, what I was thinking about, but the length between here and here is too short, so mm. it's just not going to fit in. So I had to redo it. I've been doing, redoing everything. So this one is actually going to fit in. What you do is you, you start across here, cast on, knit the lace trellis section, and then you pick up stitches and you knit the little ribbing downwards. So I'm up to knitting the little ribbing downwards and this is going to fit. So this will fit better. Okay. So, so did you, sorry, did you start from the bottom or from the top? You start here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and you knit upwards. I'll and show then... you. Hold this. Yeah. So you cast oh. on 
you cast on here and then you knit the cap up this way. Is that why there's this little line here? And this is the back side. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then you pick up stitches here and you knit the two by two ribbing downwards. Okay. Okay? Cool. You've exposed all of my backside, <laughs> ugly side <laughs> stuff. So now the viewers know all about that. <laughs> so that's my silly mistake. This one should fit, hopefully. I feel like I've knitted every single part of this design two or three times for very stupid reasons. But anyway, so that's what it's going to look like. And I think in the end, it's going to be good. Can I ask you one more question? Very fast. How did you come up with the number of stitches that you need to do around here? Did you look at how many stitches were around the, the armhole of your body? Or? Well, that's a long story and I have done that a few times. Okay. You'll have to watch some previous episodes. <laughs> you have to watch different episodes. Okay. You just have to get the calculation right. But I was being lazy and not quite looking at... Sometimes I was knitting on the wrong needle size and then other times I wasn't actually calculating and with my gauge. I was just doing a whole lot of beginner mistakes. It's a mess, Mum. Anyway, it'll work out all right. I don't know where my brain's gone in the last in the last few weeks. But let me move on and tell you about the yarn that we've been using. Okay. <laughs> it's called Elements DK. Here it is. And it comes from the West Yorkshire Spinners. It's one of their most recent yarns and it is a standard DK weight yarn so it knits up to be 22 stitches and 28 rows to 10 centimetres square in stocking stitch. So it was really easy to pair up with a Kim Hargraves design and that's actually one of the reasons why I did because at the last minute I thought oh, if I finish my project in the UK I'll need another one. So I grabbed this yarn and grabbed a Kim Hargraves book and I took it, <laughs> took it with me. So you've always got it on stash. Yes, so I've... So I've, um, yeah, it was easy to put together. It's a beautiful yarn. It's a blend of 40% tensile and 60% Falklands Merino wool. So tensile is a branded lyocell fibre, which comes from the pulp of trees. This was new to me, so I had to look it up. So the wood pulp is dissolved in a non-toxic organic solvent, and then it's forced through really fine holes, and that's how it produces a fibre and the solvent and the water are recycled in a closed loop process with 99% of the solvent and the water being recovered and reused. So that's a huge improvement on the traditional semi-synthetic fibres like viscose and rayon mm. because of this improved the closed, closed loop, loop. Yeah. process. Yeah. That's pretty okay. cool. It is really cool. So the texture of tensile is light and soft and airy and very drapey it can be a little bit like cotton too so it's very breathable and like wool it's got moisture wicking properties so it's got all this good stuff this to my eyes this tensile wool blend actually reminds me of a 4060 silk wool blend because it is just so lustrous and, and shiny and drapey you can see how drapey it is it's very drapey yeah, very drapey <laughs> So the Elements DK come in 10 really pretty spring colours. What I'm using is fresh water and the West Yorkshire spinners know that we rarely knit any accessories so they actually sent us two quantities worth for jumpers, two jumpers quantities worth of yarn. And as you can see, Madeline, put your knitting down, is also has also made herself something out of fresh water. Yeah. So without intending to, we have become... Mother, daughter. Matchy, matchy. Matchy, matchy. <laughs> so the West Yorkshire Spinners are kindly offering Fruity Knitting Patrons a 10% discount off their Elements DK yarn from their online store. And as I said, there are 10 beautiful colours in what I would describe as a soft spring colour palette. It's a really beautiful, lightweight and lustrous yarn, so I hope you enjoy checking it out. And thank you very much to the West Yorkshire Spinners. We'd like to remind our viewers that we are entirely dependent on the financial support of our patrons to keep producing fruity knitting. We don't sell anything and we don't receive money from advertising or sponsorship. So we do ask you that if you are watching to please support our work by becoming a patron. It is really easy and flexible to do this and you can pick your very own level of support. So thank you very much and a huge thank you to all of the wonderful patrons who have kept yeah. the show going so far. 
Okay, so now we're on to bring and brag with Madeline. She has had a lot more success with her design than I've had with mine. So <laughs> tell us about I it. I have had some help with mum in the details though. Um, yes, yeah, so as mum said, I've been knitting in the Elements DK as well in the same colour. And I picked another Kim Hargraves design, but from her latest summer collection, Divine. Unfortunately, a few days after mum bought this book, I spilt water over it, so now it's quite crinkly inside. <laughs> That's really sad. It's her latest collection. <laughs> I know, and it's her last collection before retirement. I did sit up all evening with my fan, with my hair dryer, trying to dry the pages before they all stuck together. And I think I was successful in that. Anyway. And now they're just nice and wavy. Yes. Okay. So the design I chose is called Indy, and it's a really pretty summer top with lots of lace. Indy is either a summer top or you can make it longer and turn it into a summer mini dress. And I was very, very tempted to make the dress because we do have enough yarn, but because the lace goes down over your bottom, you need to wear something underneath it. So I figured the top would be more versatile as you can wear it both as a summer top and as a spring vest with a blouse underneath. So the recommended yarn for Indy is the Rowan Creative Linen, which is a DK weight yarn with 50% linen and 50% cotton. The Elements DK is a good substitute for the row and stitch gauge, but it's not perfect for the fibre content. So as mum said, it's 60% merino and 40% tensile. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that means my garment is lighter than the original design, but it's also uh, pulling in more because of the merino. So we were worried that the lace wouldn't show properly, which is why we blocked it very strongly to show the holes and make the fabric lie more flat. But I think that yeah. was successful. Yes. Yeah. At first I thought it may not be a good substitute because merino has memory and it'll pull in a bit more, whereas the, the yarn it's meant to be knitted in is cotton mm. linen, which is just going to be very open. But I think it's worked out to be open enough yeah. and, and it's blocked out really well. Yes. But it is really simple, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So say how it's constructed. Um, it's constructed in pieces. You just need the front and the back piece and then sew it up together along the sides. Um, it starts off with this 2x2 two two rib for 7cm and then you work a simple lace pattern for pretty much the entire body. As you can see there is no waist shaping and for the armholes you just cast off and do some decreases. Um, so I think it's really easy. Uh, Kim classed this as uh, two dots which means it's for the average knitter. But I think she just did it because of the lace and even that's not difficult. Well you think that she's done average and not a beginner yeah. because it is a lace design, yeah. Yeah. But okay. let me show you a picture of the lace pattern. Now the lace pattern has eight rows, but out of those eight rows, three of them are knit rows and one is a pearl row. So there's only four rows where you actually have to do some lace patterning. And these pattern rows are in themselves also very easy to memorize. On one row, all you do is knit one yarn forward and repeat. On another patterned row, you just keep knitting two together across the row. And for the other two patterned rows, you pull the yarn around the needle and then purl two together and repeat. So for a lace pattern, it's very simple. Nevertheless, this was my very first lace pattern and mum strongly warned me that it wouldn't be easy to ladder down to fix any mistakes, so I should use lifelines. So back in one of the early episodes, mum showed you her trick of using dental floss, of all things, as a lifeline, and how you can thread it through the little hole in the Chiagu interchangeable needles. So then, as you can see here, you knit across the row and it carries the dental floss across the row automatically as well. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just goes along the cable. Yeah. But you didn't have Chiagus. No, I didn't have Chiagus. I had different interchangeable needles without holes. So I used an embroidery needle instead. And that worked fine. But you didn't even end up using your lifelines, which is great. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't make any mistakes. No. Well that done. was unusual. <laughs> Anyway, if you're a beginner knitter, well, at least new to lace, I can recommend this design. I think it's very pretty and it's very simple. Yes, we don't have a fashion show, unfortunately. We didn't have time to do one, but you can see her in it. Yeah, and coming up now is our Makers segment with the historical milliner Neil Forton. <laughs> Oh, 
1880s, the millinery business was a larger employer than the clothing industry. Nowadays, milliners are a rare breed, but we've found one here in Bath and he does extraordinary things. Neil Fortin is making historical ladies' bonnets and gentlemen's top hats for reenactors from all over the world. So Neil, you're a professional costume designer who specialises in period tailoring, corsetry and millinery. What kind of work have you done during your career so far and how did you come to be making hats for reenactors? Sure. Um, so I actually got my Master's of Costume Design and Construction from Boston University in America. Um, and from there, I learned millinery, corsetry, as you said, men's tailoring, dyeing, how to curl feathers, all of that kind of great stuff. Um, and because it's a design program, um, mm -hmm. I was able to kind of dabble in all of those aspects. Okay. Um, when I moved to Bath, um, I saw a real kind of gap in the market uh, for true, beautiful, um, really well-made uh, historical headwear for men and for women mostly. So it allowed me to take what I learned at BU and really put it into full production here um, in, in England. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that gap might be the Jane Austen Festival, is that right? Absolutely, yeah. Well, could you tell us more about that and tell us what kind of people go there and what happens? Sure. Um, so the Jane Austen Festival here in Bath uh, happens uh, once every year, uh, usually the second weekend in September. And it is a full week-long um, series of events, if you will. So it includes um, seminars, talks, performances, um, and the sort of capsule um, events are large either uh, parties or balls or country dances. The people who come are usually either Jane Austen fans um, who maybe never have worn period clothes in their life or really serious um, period reenactors. Um, so it's not so much the Jane Austen aspect of things that they love, but the, the dressing up that they love. Mm -hmm. um, people come from literally all over the world. I've sold hats to people from Japan, from Malta, lots from the United States, obviously a ton from England. Um, and they really kind of enjoy the week living um, as if it were the Regency period. So from about 1800 to 1820, um, with multiple costume changes a day. They have uh, things for breakfast, things for lunch, uh, things for evening events, a different hat for each one of those things. That's mm -hmm. where I kind of slid right in. And it's really exciting to see Bath as this beautiful Georgian historical city uh, come to life with like real costumed characters yeah, around. Yeah, I can it's, imagine. It's pretty cool. Then when you have customers coming to you, how do you come up with historically correct Regency hats and how do you do your research on them? Sure. So all sort of stemming from that, uh, that, that class in college, um, we used a book called From the Neck Up, um, which is an illustrated guide to hat making. Um, this book was built and uh, produced for students of millinery, specifically mm -hmm. for theater. Um, so it really involves every step of making a hat. Um, so they start off with the patterning process. We use paper patterns um, to create the shapes that we're making. Mm -hmm. um, so how to um, sort of use geometry to create um, 2D shapes that become 3D shapes like yeah. that. Um, and then it moves on to um, wiring. So all the edges of a hat need to be wired with millinery wire. Um, and then it moves on to how to sort of form the hat into the shape that it is. So you still have a 2D, bunch of 2D pieces, flat patterns, um, and those need to be made into the 3D shapes. Um, and then it teaches you how to cover everything. Um, so the fabric that you see on the outside of the hat isn't necessarily what the inside is made out of. Um, so how to cover that smoothly without any big wrinkles. Um, how to put the tip on the hat, so the very top piece um, needs to be sewn very specifically on. Okay. Um, and then it goes into how to decorate it. So how to work with feathers, how to work with flowers, um, all the different kind of uh, pieces of beauty that go on the outside of the hat. And for me, um, I really think of um, sort of this modern twist on, on historical headgear. Um, so you had asked about sort of the kind of how I join those two things together. So this, for instance, this is a Regency bonnet, um, probably right around 1813 is the shape, a very classic shape. Um, we call this our Sandy bonnet, named mm -hmm. after our first customer ever. Um, she ordered this from us, she lives here in Bath, so we named this after her. Um, so the shape is very Regency. Um, the trimmings are actual antique ribbon. Um, so this is probably late 19th century, not Regency, but still close enough, really mm -hmm. beautiful silk ribbon. But the fabric that we're using to make this is actually um, computer printed silk. 
Okay. Um, this comes from another sort of facet of my uh, career here. Um, so we had some leftover product and we used that to make a, a historical piece. Um, so I always try to twist in a bit of modern ingenuity um, to historical headwear. Yeah, okay, so I see that there are lots of interesting materials on the back here. I see feathers and some ribbons. Um, and also a bird. So could you tell us about the different materials that you work with? Absolutely. I'll kind of go from the, the inside to the outside, if you will, um, on bonnet making. Um, so the inside of bonnets is made from buckram. So buckram, the definition of uh, is fabric that's been stiffened with some sort of sizing. It can be as kind of wiggly as this buckram. So this buckram is allowed to be dipped into water. Um, and this is for pulling hats. So a kind of a different thing than we're looking at today. Uh, but you actually get it wet and pull it over a form and then let okay. it dry. And it dries into whatever form you're looking at. And it at. stays stiff then? Yeah. So okay. like the brims of top hats we use yeah. this for. Yeah. In our shop, this is the only uh, time that we would use that for a brim. Yeah. Um, and then this is Hessian buckram. Uh, in my American language, you would call it burlap buckram, but mm -hmm. hessian here uh, in England. Um, and this is uh, fabric, again, that's been stiffened with a sizing. Um, and this you can also wet, but for us, we just cut shapes out of this. Um, and that allows us to uh, create those 2D forms. Um, and then we kind of form those into the 3D shapes that you have on. Two different sort of thicknesses of that. This has some holes you can see through. Yeah. Um, and this one does not. So. Uh, depending on how uh, strong, how stiff you want the hat to be. How much weight it has to carry as Exa well. and Yeah, and this obviously will make a much stiffer but heavier hat. Um, so from there, um, the, you have your lovely shape, and then you need to cover it with some sort of fabric. Um, so for me, trying to be a bit sustainable, um, I love to use antique fabric, vintage fabric. Um, there's amazing vintage fairs in England that, that you can get really, really beautiful stuff from. So right here we have an actual uh, antique tissue taffeta. This is probably 1870, 1860. You cannot find things that look like this really anymore in the world. So I'm always excited when I find true period fabric um, to use for hats. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be sort of the outside wrap of your hat. Okay. Um, so we love to use that, that antique product. Trim-wise, uh, same kind of principle behind that. We love to use really antique things. It makes things look that much more real, that much more theatrical, that much more film-worthy, if yeah, you will. Yeah. Um, this is some handmade lace. Um, again, probably the end of the 19th century. Yeah, I've actually got some lace on this beautiful hat right here. Exactly, It goes yeah. down, I don't know if you maybe want to do it. It yeah, goes in absolutely. front of my face. It's lovely veiling. <laughs> I feel very elegant. <laughs> um, so actually using this hat is a great example um, of all the trim we might use on a hat. So on this one we have two vintage um, starling wings. Uh, we have some vintage feathers, some uh, velvet ribbon, and actually some rabbit fur trim um, from probably the 1920s. Um, so we love to kind of uh, cherry pick things from, yeah. from our travels, from uh, different antiques fairs. Um, and we know what goes together well. So kind of color-wise, this one all matches together. Um, we love antique ribbon. Um, so this was purchased at Shepton Mallet, um, which is a that great... That is quite stunning. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, Antiques Fair here, uh, about 20 minutes away from Bath. Um, this is hand-embroidered silk ribbon. Um, it's not in great shape, as you can see, um, but I will flat apply this to a hat with some spray adhesive um, so you never, like, there won't be any weight or pulling on that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really usable. I believe that this is, like, amazing stuff to use. You do have, to, again, some people that don't love to use antiques things they think they should be saved, but I think the most noble purpose of any material is to yes. be made into something beautiful. Well, thank you for showing us all these materials. I'm really excited now to get to see some of the finished Regency hats that will be on parade during the Jane Austen Festival. Absolutely. If you want to come over here, we'll take a look at some yes. of those. Uh, so here we have one of the bonnets that we'll see at the Jane Austen Festival this year. Uh, this one is made from a antique uh, silk and cotton fabric from Turkey, actually. These were used in uh, sort of those uh, wide leg pants that you see okay. and, the, and yeah. the vests. 
uh, purchased from a online antiques fabric yeah. seller. Um, with a antique ostrich feather, uh, self-fabric ties, a ruched inside uh, with some silk uh, taffeta lining. Um, we love our sort of ruched tips. Uh, the, the end of a bonnet is called the tip. Okay. Um, so that's where a lot of real estate for uh, decoration is. So you can kind of really make that interesting. Yeah. Um, here we have another uh, Jane Austen one. Um, this is a modern uh, cotton and silk as well, moray fabric, although uh, they used a lot of moray in the Regency period. Uh, but here we do have a really amazing uh, hand loomed silk ribbon, uh, probably around 1830, 1840. Um, so as you can see, there's a very small piece that we got of that, um, but definitely wanted to showcase it on this bonnet. Um, we're using a cotton bobbinet for the uh, ruched interior of the brim. Um, so you actually, actually can see the buckram on the inside of yes. that, which is yeah. kind of interesting. Um, and then some self fabric uh, binding on that one. Um, sort of as a compliment to this hat, this uh, bonnet is made out of that same uh, very kind of bright pink silk. Uh, this is a silk file. Um, so you, if you can see, it has that ribbing on it. Mm -hmm. um, and using an antique uh, Indian brocade as the decoration on this guy um, with some matching uh, navy silk ribbon ties and a self-fabric ruched inside. All these bonnets are that sandy shape that we talked about before, the very classic 1830s Regency shape. Um, but we do do other Regency uh, shapes as well. These are called toppers. Um, if you've watched Bridgerton at all, you have one on. Uh, this is the Lady Danbury shaped hat. Um, it's one of the only hats they actually used on that show. They did a lot of fascinators, a lot of feathers, but they didn't. Yeah, you don't see yeah. any bonnets on, on Bridgerton. That's true. Um, so we knew we wanted to make this, this one. Um, this is a modern fabric, actually, interestingly enough as well. Um, it is a silk, uh, but shot with metal. Um, so you have that really amazing kind of yeah, gold sort of effect. A gold gleam. Exactly. Uh, some antique silk brocade as the decoration and a antique ostrich feather plume there. Uh, this is called burnt ostrich feather. So all the fluffy bits that are normally on ostrich, mm -hmm. like this guy, they actually burn that off the feather. So you're left with this really kind of light, um, almost hair-like. Very fine. Um, yeah, really yeah. fine. Yeah. Uh, looks great in the wind. That's why, we, that's why they use it on hats. Yeah. Um, apart from Regency hats, we actually do all sorts of periods of hats as well. Um, it started Regency-wise because of the Jane Austen Festival. We have moved on from that. Um, so we have a lot of different decades uh, examples here. Um, we have a really lovely uh, coal scuttle bonnet is what that they is call so these from. Um, this is uh, from the 1840s, um, made out of a silk taffeta. Um, with a silk satin ribbon and some actual ribbon probably from, I'd say, 1880, um, which is a really kind of crisp uh, taffeta ribbon. And then on the top of it, if you can see, um, there's actual glass grape trim. So this is probably 1890s um, metal and glass um, making these like vines of grapes over the back of it. Really nice contrast to the light yeah. colors of the of the hat. So that's original, isn't it? Original, yep, okay. yeah. yeah. Really, really cool. Very you find like little bits of this uh, because a lot of it came off of extant clothing that was mm -hmm. falling apart. Um, so lots of textile um, dealers will sell just these little bits of it. But for me, that's great. You probably couldn't use that in costuming because uh, there's not enough of it, mm -hmm. but a hat takes small amounts of things. So we're yeah. really lucky to have that. Yeah. Uh, 1850s hat, um, you have this guy called the spoon bonnet because uh, if you imagine that tied under your chin, it makes sort of like your head like a spoon shape. Yeah. Um, this is made in antique uh, silk taffeta, um, some modern silk taffeta, and then some handmade um, lace on that tip. So again, that, that real estate in the back is always fun to use for mm -hmm. uh, displaying large kind of pieces of, of really beautiful handmade yeah. materials. Do you know who would have worn that? Um, so these are all sort of upper middle class to upper class okay, women. Yeah. Um, that's all based on fabric choice. So silks, laces, velvet, all those things, sort of your um, maybe middle or lower class people wouldn't be able to afford. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, people who do these reenactments tend to portray um, middle and upper class people. Um, I think because of part of the kind of fantasy of it all. Yes. Um, there are people that love to portray the working class 
um, but they aren't the ones kind of buying these. Yeah. And I would love to see more of that, to be honest. It would be okay. amazing to see really beautiful, historically accurate working class folks. But a lot of people come to Bath, they want a beautiful weekend, they don't want to wear kind of scrubby scrubby clothes. Yeah, but there are other people that do. As, they wouldn't have been as colorful, would they? No, not, definitely not yeah. as colorful. The dyes weren't accessible to people that didn't have the money to, mm. to purchase those things. Yeah. Um, 1860s wise, uh, we have this guy. So this was technically a riding hat. Um, so similar yeah, to the first one you wore with the veiling, uh, this would help keep the dirt out of your eyes when you were riding your horse. Uh, antique ostrich, um, more of that antique burnt ostrich as well. Uh, some lovely uh, antique, probably 20th century antique. So 20s or 30s blackberries on the back. Um, some really long tie strings. Um, and it kind of sits at that angle on your head. Um, really shallow crown, yeah, which is lovely. This is some of that handmade lace that we had looked at before. Um, just a really nice big swatch of it. So you can see really the, the beautiful patterning on that. Uh, 1870s, they actually swung back two bonnets, um, but you can see sort of the uh, difference in scale. They're smaller, tighter, more compact. Um, that first hat that you tried on today, the black one, is also sort of from this period. So you can see everything got a bit smaller. Um, you really had to jam all the decoration on uh, because you had a smaller palette to work with. But it does make for a really kind of beautiful feast um, of colors and texture. Um, this is using a uh, silk, uh, silk velvet, silk and cotton, um, with some rooster feathers that have been dyed in that really kind of crazy way. And this really amazing antique brocade ribbon. Um, the color on that is amazing that that's old. That's probably that's from old. around, yeah, from 1880. That's amazing. I would say, I know. The, the colors wow. that they used were really, really beautiful. Yeah. Um, and then some probably 1850s silk uh, passementry trim. Um, so again, that piece, it's a really small piece, so a customer really wouldn't be able to use that, mm -hmm. um, but we love that stuff because it's usually cheaper. Um, and then we just have that small amount that we can yeah, use. Yeah. And this is lined in a uh, tissue silk taffeta in that amazing stripe. 1890s wise, uh, you have these beautiful, big, kind of robust hats, um, and they really love using those wings on mm -hmm. those. And this is probably a medium-sized one, too. Like, the crowns get larger and larger and larger. Mm -hmm. The decorations get bigger. The ruching gets more. Um, so they're a really great way of showcasing a lot of those big wings and big feathers. This is all made out of a um, silk moire. Um, so it has that sort of watered silk effect to it. And all lined and uh, ruched under brim in that same fabric as well. This hat actually reminds me of Anne of Green Gables. I'd sort of imagine wearing a really puffed sleeve dress with it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <and ball. laughs> I think it's my favorite time period, to be very honest. I love the Regency stuff. And, and like yeah. I said, we um, have a great clientele for that. But really, the 1890s are my favorite things to do, I would say. So welcome back. It was such a treat to feature those amazing historical bonnets and to have Neil go through all the styles of bonnets mm -hmm. in the 18th and 19th century. So Madeline and I now have going to a Jane Austen festival in full historical costume and bonnet and dancing a minuet on our bucket list. Absolutely. <laughs> That is just the kind of nerdy thing I would love to do. When I was at university, I was in the Society for Creative Anachronism, which is the medieval society. Oh. So we would just dress up in medieval clothes, we'd have a persona, and we'd just pretty well go to parties or banquets, and you couldn't talk about anything in the 20th century. So I, I didn't know that. Didn't you? No. Haven't I told you? No. Uh. What did you dress up as? Oh, different things at different times. It depends what, you know, sometimes a witch, sometimes it, people tend to, to try to dress up, like Neil said, in the upper classes because you get to mm. wear better stuff <laughs> and you have more freedom. That's so wacky. Yeah, it is really wacky, but it is a lot of fun. It's a great way to party. Anyway, 
Before we show you any new knitting projects, we have our little tour of Bath coming up next with all of its glorious Georgian architecture. And this actually might inspire some of you to join us at the next Jane Austen Festival. This grand street was built in 1791. It's called Bath Street. It's flanked by colonnades that lead the eye to the cross bath bathing pool at the end of the road. It's such an impressive location. It was used in the 1995 Jane Austen period drama, Persuasions, and then more recently in the Netflix Bridgerton series, when we're first introduced to the Duke of Hastings as he canters down Bath Street. On the other end of Bath Street, adjacent to the Roman Baths, is the Grand Pump Room, which features in both of Jane Austen's novels, Persuasions and Northanger Abbey. And this is where visitors would come to drink the waters for medicinal purposes. On the other side of this archway is one of the oldest squares in Bath. It's called Abbey Green. And in the centre of this very charming little square is a gigantic plane tree which was planted in 1793. And Bridgerton fans will recognise the Abbey Deli as Madame de la Croix's dress shop, the Modiste, where all the gossip happened while the characters had their garments fitted. And the building dates back to 1699 and now it's a cafe. This is the famous Pulteney Bridge, built in 1774, and it crosses the River Avon in Bath. It's a World Heritage Site, and it's one of only four bridges worldwide to have shops across its entire span on both sides. So when you're crossing the bridge, it just feels like you're walking along another pretty street because you don't get to have a view of the water. The Royal Crescent is the most famous street in Bath. We showed it to you in our UK travel vlog, but we'd be really remiss if we didn't include it again in this little tour of Bath. The facade of these houses was designed by the architect John Wood, and he made them all look uniform. Then different people bought up sections of the facade and employed their own architect to customise the rear of the houses. So this means that while on the front side, everything is perfectly uniform, on the back, each house looks really unique. Here's the street that leads up to the Abbey for the most incredible view. Bath Abbey is the last great medieval cathedral to be built in England. It took 120 years to build, starting in 1499 and ending in 1660. And apparently there's been a place of Christian worship on the site of Bath Abbey for over 1,200 years, which is pretty incredible to imagine. And what I find quite funny is that on either side of the Abbey entrance, you can see little angels ascending and descending Jacob's ladder. I just love the humour in these little sculptures. And here is the tomb of Jane, who died in 1633. Her husband erected the tomb in her memory, and it depicts the husband and wife lying next to one another for eternity.
This is the most incredibly stunning fan vault ceiling. Fan vault ceilings provide structural stability because they distribute the weight of the roof over the ribs and onto the supporting columns. Bath Abbey is really one of the most beautiful cathedrals I've ever been to. It was such a privilege to see it, but I always imagine how wonderful it would be to visit it when you're all alone in complete silence. It's time now for some pop psychology as it applies to us knitters. I'm going to talk about two similar phenomena today that have to do with us relying on others to help us out of tricky situations. One is called learned helplessness and the other is called strategic incompetence and the latter is the sneaky cousin. So it all started back in 1967 with an experiment where they put dogs in boxes and exposed them to electrical currents through the floor. Anyway, they split the dogs into three different groups and each group was put to, under a different condition. The dogs in group one could turn off the electric current if they pressed a lever down with their nose. The dogs in group two were given no option to escape or turn off the current. And the dogs in group three, they just weren't exposed to an electric current because they were the control group. So that was phase one of the experiment and in phase two, all three groups were put under the same condition. So the dogs were placed again into a box, but this time the box had a little, it was split into two halves by a little wall in the middle. And the electrical current only flowed on one side of the wall. So the dogs in group one, who had previously learned that they could turn off the current if they pressed the lever down with their nose, this time they quickly learned to jump over the wall to the safe side of the box to escape the current. And the dogs from group three, who had previously not been exposed to an electric current, also learned to jump over the wall to the safe side of the box. But the dogs from group two, who had previously learned that they had no control over the electric current, made no attempt this time to escape. So the, yeah, they just accepted it. And the researchers, they termed this passive reaction, learned helplessness. So learned helplessness is when you expect to have no control over a new situation based on your previous experiences, and therefore you no longer attempt to change a new unpleasant situation for the better. And an everyday example of this for humans yeah. can be found in high school, where students who struggle to keep up in class or just repeatedly give the wrong answer may conclude that it's simply not worth trying anymore and they just give up or elderly people who suddenly struggle with increased health issues, they may actually start doing less for their health than before they got sick. So researchers also found that you can either reduce or reinforce learned helplessness. Say you ask people for help, but every time they end up doing the task for you, then that's reinforcing your learned helplessness. And I try to apply this concept <laughs> to knitting and myself. I can see where this is going. Okay, go It's on. a bit of a long shot, but I can think of an example of how I used to suffer from learned helplessness in the past, especially when I was a beginner knitter. Whenever I made a mistake, mum would fix it for me. So she did teach me the basics of how to pick up a knit or a purl stitch that I dropped down one or two rows. But when the mistakes got a little more complicated, she would just say, that's too tricky for you, but I'll have it fixed in no time. So for a long time, my default was just to hand over my knitting to mum whenever I made a mistake. I can see I'm going to get into trouble for this. <laughs> <laughs> Keep well, going. That behavior was learned helplessness because I genuinely thought I would not be able to fix those mistakes by myself. Uh -huh. But sometimes I would exaggerate my helplessness a little. For example, if I made a mistake several rows down, uh, I, that would usually mean I'd have to unpick a lot of my knitting and who wants to do that? So in those cases, <laughs> I would make sure to let out a deep sigh and huff and puff a little to communicate my distress and that would usually get mum's attention and she'd say, what's up Madeline? To which my response is usually something like, oh, this is just taking so long and mum, I think I'm making a mistake unpicking this. So a moment later, mum's holding my knitting and she does all the tedious work of unpicking for me. 
So that is not learned helplessness, but it's sneaky cousin strategic incompetence. <laughs> it is the art of getting someone else to do a usually undesirable task for you by making them think that you're just too incompetent to do it yourself. <laughs> so strategic incompetence is different from learned helplessness in that you know that you'd actually be able to fix that mistake by yourself if you simply invested the time and effort into it. Well, I have to let you in on a little secret because mm -hmm. when it comes to dealing with technical problems on the computer, oh, yes. I also employ a little strategic incompetence and I'm really happy to say that Madeline complies very nicely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe it's just about helping out with crappy jobs <laughs> when you've got a natural ability or tendency towards doing them. Yes. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, perhaps you can reflect on your own knitting and see if you are employing strategic incompetence or anywhere other aspect of your life or learned helplessness. <laughs> So we've now got something very special to share with you. This little chap was sent to us from a dear patron in Australia. Her name is Jill and she's been a fruit and knitting patron right from the beginning, which is very special to us. So Madeline has called him Kurt the Koala after an ex-Australian boyfriend. He wasn't my boyfriend. He looked like your boyfriend to me. Anyway, Kurt the Koala and his namesake are both quintessential Aussie mm. blokes. So it is a really good name. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Kurt is designed by the toy designer Alan Dart, who we interviewed in episode 118. And he's just adorable and I wanted to share him with you, so I asked Jill to tell me about her experience knitting him. So after she had seen Alan Dart's interview, she thought his toy patterns were the most beautiful toy patterns she'd ever seen and she wanted to knit her first ever toy. And I have to tell you that Jill is a really accomplished knitter and she's mm. also got her own podcast. So she used the recommended yarn, which is the Sirdar Hayfield Bonus DK. She found it really coarse to work with, but she loves the texture that it's given the toy. And it is a standard DK weight yarn, but you knit it on three millimeter needles. So it gives the toy a lot of strength and the stuff mm. the stuffing doesn't show through. And I think the toy looks fantastic, actually. It, it, looks, it looks really well it made. And really I, I like that, that they're on such small needles because it's such a nice tight gauge. It yes. Looks Okay, so all the pieces are knitted flat and separately and then sewn up in mattress stitch. And with toys, you often get just a whole lot of little pieces and each piece or each row might only have a few stitches. So Jill found that just working on a small DPN like this was the way to go. And she put a rubber mm -hmm. stopper on the end to stop the, the stitches falling off. And that was just a lot easier on her wrists because you're, you're turning your needle around a lot with small rows. So here's a picture that Jill sent me of Kurt the koala in the early stages. You start with the head and the body first and you join them together. The fingers and the toes were the hardest part because they're so tiny and fiddly. And just as Alan said to do in the interview, Jill used tweezers to stuff the little fingers and toes. And I think they look really good. The other tricky part for Jill was the ears. I don't think she enjoyed knitting with the eyelash yarn. So the ears have two parts, the stocking stitch outer and the furry inner ear. Oh, and another thing Jill mentioned was that when you first complete all the individual pieces, they can look really similar. So it's just a good idea to label them. Next came Kurt's Akubra hat with corks attached to keep the flies away. So the hat and the corks were very straightforward to knit. And Jill made the waistcoat in my favorite color, which wasn't lost on me. Thank you, Jill. And if you have a close look at the waistcoat, it has adorable little pockets and the buttons are made with embroidered French knots. Now, finally, we have to show you this picture because this is how Kurt was packed up and sent to us. He's nestled between two packets of Tim Tams, which along with Vegemite, Cherry Ripes, Lamingtons and Pavlovas are the national food of Australians. Now, there is a particularly gross way of eating Tim Tams that I should probably share with you. Most Australians know this already. If you don't know what a Tim Tam is, it's a chocolate biscuit. It's got biscuit on the outside and chocolate on the inside. And what you can do, it's, about, it's sort of about that shape. You nibble off the top and you nibble off the bottom and you stick the Tim Tam, you dip it into your coffee and you suck your coffee through the Tim Tam like a straw. Yeah. 
It's particularly delicious, but it's also rather disgusting. Oh, it's great. And what you have to do is because the coffee melts the Tim Tam in your mouth, you have to, after taking one or two sips, you have to quickly stuff it into your mouth so it can melt on your tongue. I love Tim Tams. It's a fine art of eating it that you've Absolutely. perfected. Yes. So you can imagine when we opened the parcel and we saw Kurt staring back out at us, surrounded by Tim Tams, oh. how happy Madeline was. I was thrilled. <laughs> Okay, so getting back to the pattern, Jill found Alan's patterns to be extremely well written and as a result she's ordered more toys to knit up. So you'll probably, Kurt will probably be present in future episodes. He might just be having a snooze over by the fruit bowl. So it's time to finish up the episode. Mm -hmm. Coming up very soon is the wonderful interview with Alex Bird that I'm sure you're really going to love. In two weeks' time, we're going to be in Canada in the Prince Edward Island Fiverr Festival. They're paying for our tickets to go over there and we, so we can cover the show. Very exciting for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you very much for spending time with us. We had a blast. I hope you did too. And we're looking forward to seeing you next episode. Bye. Bye. Welcome to Fruity Knitting. Today my guest is Alex Bird, who's an illustrator, knitwear designer, and the recent author of this book, Traditions Revisited Modern Estonian Knits. And Alex refers to herself as a Veilisa Estlana, which is or which means an Estonian who's born and raised abroad. And through this book, Alex is introducing us to some of the traditional Estonian knitting techniques, but she's put a fresh twist on them by making them into modern wearable designs. And Alex has also done us the honor of dressing up in her traditional Estonian costume today, and you look fantastic. It's so, it's so great to have you on Fruity Knitting. Thank you, I'm very excited to be here. Good. <laughs> So let's start by you telling us more about your connection to Estonia and Estonian knitting. Sure. So I grew up in a multicultural home in Washington, D.C. in the United States. My mom is Estonian and Canadian and my dad American. I grew up with nannies or au pairs from Estonia to be raised bilingual, speaking with them in Estonian and my mom. And then my grandmother, my Vanaima, from my mom's side, she is the one that really got me into knitting. So she taught my mom how to knit the basics, and then my mom taught me those same basics. Um, she unfortunately couldn't teach me the Estonian techniques, but um, her book collection and the collection that my mom then grew sparked my interest um, as a young adult. Okay, so it was really your grandmother who did most of the knitting. Yes, okay, she was a yeah. she was a really excellent knitter, really into lace knitting in particular. Now you've got to quickly tell the viewers about your costume. It's so gorgeous. Sure. So my costume is from one of the islands called Muhu. So starting from the top, I have what is a boat hat, so a bathy moots in Estonian, and then worn by maidens or single women. And then my blouse is a linen blouse with a bit of embroidery details on the shoulder, cuffs, and around the neck. Then I also have a bridal apron. So this goes over top of a striped wool skirt and the colors will delineate what island it is from okay but this is not a, there's it's the not, bridal skirt no it? no it's not <laughs> I'm mixing and matching a bit today okay. the bridal skirt surprisingly is a really bright orange isn't yes. it yes so yeah. it is either a orange or a yellow the orange is actually the older color but I really like the orange anyway so yes. that's so do I <laughs> orange is a good color it's like this gorgeous hat yes here. so it yeah. matches the hat yes yeah okay now from my understanding knitting and other textile crafts are highly regarded in Estonia so what can you tell us about the history and culture of knitting in Estonia? Sure. So 
Estonia is located in northeastern Europe, so just south of Finland, bordering Russia and Latvia. And knitting is an absolute essential thing even today. So it's all about form, functionality and necessity as well as decoration. So it's cold there in the winter, so it can get down to minus 23 Celsius. So you need really warm knits and the traditional ones are knit at a very, very tight gauge to be windproof. So about 56 stitches to four inches or 10 centimeters on very small needles, about two millimeters or smaller. So small wire sticks, um, but they were done in really interesting different regional styles. So you can tell where someone is from. And it was in its heyday in about the 18th, 19th century. So lots of different styles. Mostly what you see in museums today has been collected in the 20th century from the islands. So similar to what I'm wearing, matching to that. Um, very bright, colourful, and those places were actually where the costumes that I'm wearing were worn longer, um, including one Gihno, where they're still wearing that every day, which is very impressive. But, In 2022? Yes, that's great. they have UNESCO heritage status for that specifically. Um, but yes, so every part of Estonia has its own colour work pattern, colour palette, and oftentimes stitch patterns. So you can match um, a person's knit to their costume. You can tell how, whether they're married or not, um, even widowed and from North South islands, just based on their knitting and their outfit. Uh, some areas have specific techniques, which I've covered in the book, but in more of a modern way. And Okay, wow. <laughs> so there's a lot. That's just kind of a very and, brief. <laughs> and what I read was that the brides actually had to do quite a lot of knitting, didn't they, when yes. they got married to give yes. it to their relatives? Yes, so yeah. usually knitwear was done partly for a dowry for brides, so they would hand it out to their in-laws, so their new relatives, as well as for other social occasions, including funerals, so you could pay off the grave digger with a pair of mittens. Um, so it was its own currency. It, yeah, exactly. So what have we got on the table here? What can you quickly say about these? So these are examples from kind of the more colourful areas. So we've got stockings from the island of Moho. So those actually match my outfit. So bright colours, colour work patterns up into a little bit of lace towards the top of the stocking. So they hit just over the knee. And this bright pink is actually a traditional colour, isn't it? What is it called? Yes, so Moho uses orange, yellow and pink and the pink you really only find in Moho and the bright pink in English you could call it Moho pink or in Estonian you might see it as Kipe Rosa, okay. which is just a bright pink. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Okay, and these designs are also really regional specific, are they? Yes, so yeah. um, Moho is known for its floral designs. Um, it's very nature inspired, so a lot of the patterns on the stockings as well as mittens use flowers as well as birds are very common. Okay, yeah, I like that. I like the florals. And what about these gloves here? We've got two sets. Are they from the same island? So they're not from the same island, but they are from the southwest coast, so not too far away, easily to get to by boat. So they're from Dustama, so one of the parishes in Estonia, and they are known for fringe and rovosimina, so the inlay technique and it actually, they have a bit of a connection with Mohu and that the inlay technique was inspired by floral embroidery from Mohu and when that was translated into knit, it became this. Okay, and the gorgeous fringe. And it is such a fine gauge. It, it does look machine knit, doesn't it? It's so fine. It does not have any give. So compared to what we knit now, there's zero give, but it is very windproof for that reason. So. I love it. I love <laughs> it's it. beautiful. I have yeah. knit a little bit at that gauge, but it is very challenging. And you bought these in Estonia? So those, yes, I bought those. They are from the kind of knitters that are doing the traditional knits, um, taught by the master knitters. Okay. Yeah. And actually you spent some time with the master knitters. So tell us where that was exactly and who are the master knitters? It sounds very important. <laughs> very and what you learned from them? <laughs> um, so I've spent with kind of three different areas in Estonia. So um, one is the lace knitters. So probably most people 
kind of globally know Estonia for lace knitting, particularly the bobble stitch and mm-hmm. the nop. Um, so they're all in Harpsalo, which is a coastal um, town, very beautiful. And I sat with the ladies there and they got me doing the correct way of doing the bobble. Um, it's not as hard as it looks. Um, a lot of loops, but worth it. And then the beautiful gloves are from the Stama. And I've spent a lot of time chatting and sitting with um, Anu Randma, who's actually part of... So in Estonia, we have the Estonian Folk Art and Craft Union. So they kind of oversee preserving all of these beautiful techniques and all the handcrafts that are highly regarded. So kind of the title of Master Knitter, which sounds very important and illustrious, a lot of that comes from this craft union. So they are entitled to preserving it and making sure that keeps going generation to generation and the patterns are maintained as well. Okay, so a Master Knitter would have to prove that they know the whole knowledge of their particular region and all the skill sets. They can do them very beautifully and then is their job to also teach? Yes, so it's very specialised, usually based on the specific region. So the lace knitters in Harpson, they do lace knitting. They won't really do much beyond that. Um, and then the ones in Dustama, they will do the fringe and the inlay. And it kind of works sort of like an apprenticeship. So if someone new is coming in, they'll kind of sit with the master knitters and they go through all of that. And it varies the length of time in terms of learning all of that there's a lot and it's constantly changing and you did that didn't you I did like for little, little bit. bits yeah. yeah so when I've gone I've been interested and go okay I want to understand more and usually everyone's very welcoming going okay wonderful come we'll show you and they show you exactly the way they do it um pass down 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 um the only changes you get is a little bit with the yarns um Obviously, traditional knits are done with local Estonian sheep. Scratchy wool. Scratchy wool. <laughs> so like a white Estonian sheep, uh, white head Estonian sheep. So scratchy wool or a Gekno sheep. Scratchy. My relatives don't really like the scratchiness. Don't they? <laughs> uh, no. Um, but now there are some yarns, particularly to get the colour palettes. We have some yarn coming from Denmark um, as well as Norway. So expanding. Um, still very fine gauge. Um, so lace weight, very light fingering weight. Okay. Yarns. Now let's come back to the master knitters because yes. that sounds so romantic. <laughs> I would love to go and see Yeah, it. I can't claim myself as a master. But yeah, one of the other masters is Eli Koryam, who is based in Kihno. So the only island left wearing their national costume every day. Mm-hmm. And she is the only one left knitting this style of sweater which is called a troy which is a fisherman's men's fisherman sweater and it uses stranded color work but also um, these really sweet little braids which are my favorite which are the kichnovitz or kichno braid so you'll get techniques named after the places they're from on certain occasions okay and the construction of this typical fisherman's sweater is bottom up and it's done in the round but then when you split for the front and back they have done it flat, um, which, yes, colour work flat is yeah. more of an old fashion technique. And is this is this typical here to, to have the braiding and colour work on the shoulders? Yes, so you get the braiding and colour work is done on the cuffs, shoulders and hem. And that adds a little bit of added embellishment detail. So Australian knitting is all about adding a little bit extra to it. And the patterns will shift um, they're bespoke to the wearer usually. So Ellie, who does this, she makes new colour work patterns for every every sweater. No two are the same. And this is a modern colour palette. Usually it's done with a navy white or mm. a black and then red for the braids to give a little bit of good luck and protection for the wearer. Now there was a uh, master knitter who was bringing back an old forgotten technique, wasn't there? Yes. Just tell us quickly about that. Sure. So Anu Randma, who is part of the craft union, she also runs the handcraft centre in Dostama, which is where Rosimina, the inlay technique, is from. And she brought this technique back after it had been forgotten for about 100 years um, when she was making her national costume and needed that technique on a pair of stockings. So she figured out from records how to do it and has taught then everyone in the area how to do it again, revitalized it. 
and she's actually how I learned about this technique. Yeah, okay, that's that's really fascinating. Let's go to your book now. Um, and can you talk about the techniques that you've used in this book? And you've already said a lot about how they were used traditionally, but maybe more specifically, you can say how they were used historically and then show us how you've used them in your designs and done your modern take on them. And quickly with the, the uh, master knitters, do any of them know about this book? Yes. And are they happy? Yes. So two of them, um, who I've mentioned, Anu Ranma and Eli Goryam, they both have copies of the book. Oh, I sent it and... Um, Yes, we've been in conversation back and forth and they're very excited about it because a lot of Estonian patterns are not very detailed written out and they're excited to see it preserved and kind of continued and that other people are interested outside of Estonia. So in the book I cover five techniques. There are loads of techniques but these are some of my favourites. So rotimina, knitted braids, fringe, baubles and Vikel twisted travelling stitches and they are all deceptively easy so they look a lot harder and impressive than they are to knit. Great news. <laughs> you can tackle any project. So we'll start off with probably one of my favourites which is Rosimina. So it's historically and traditionally used on small projects. So gloves, mittens and stockings in areas similar to what you'd think of in Tarja. So on one side of your knitting. And it creates the look of embroidery while you knit. Very easy to do. And it was inspired by this floral embroidery from Moho, where my outfit is, in, is from. And this translated into knitwear. In Tostama became of this beautiful inlay technique. And these are the shoes you're meant to be wearing with this outfit. I know, yes. <laughs> but we wanted to show you. Gorgeous. Okay. And then you've put it into... So into larger projects. So the book covers both large and small, but this is a really great quick knit. So this is the Vesky sweater, which uses Rotimina in a large scale project. So on the front of the sweater and then small sleeve details, all done in worsted weight yarn. So very quick to do. Super fast, easy to do. It makes that embroidery look really high impact. So and what is it? Because it looks like the floats on the right side. It is creating intentional floats. This is where you can flaunt your floats. In colour work, <laughs> you want to hide the floats. Here we're intentionally making floats. So you're only knitting with one colour, which is your main colour, what I like to call the canvas colour. And then the contrast colours are essentially woven in and out. A very interesting way to make this beautiful pattern. So it's a bit of magic. And it's a little bit like a, like a it's intarsia sort of because you're not carrying those colors right around no so yeah. it's in one spot so like on a jumper it's just on the front or when you're looking at small projects so like the gloves it's just on the back of your hand okay they're going to want to see this <laughs> show the I haven't asked side. for permission but look, so there it is there on the yes. front and there and there's not there on oh. the back so this is an exciting we've yes. I'm, it's a magic there's you basically do it over two rounds of knitting. So it's always done in the round, so not done flat. Okay. Um, but very simple to do. Um, lots of different projects. So that's the gilp sweater, so a different variation. Slightly smaller pattern, repeated down the And it the looks front. great just in one colour. Yes, yeah, so that's one colour, which is a fading yarn. So can really let your yarn sing and do a lot of the magic work for you. And you've also done it on a little project with these gloves. Yes, it's a really nice segue project. So that has the rotimina, but also the fringe, which is they usually go hand in hand together on the traditional projects. So see, that's the traditional, very tight gauge. Everything that I've done in the book is a variety of yarn weights. So all the way from lace yarn held double to worsted weight. So lots of different needle sizes, but that's a really sweet quick project so you can can make them a flip top or you can keep them as just a one mitten okay but flip top's nice if you need to use your phone or quick access to things good so getting on to the fringes what is the estonian word for the fringes normat normat <laughs> something like so, that yeah so okay. they're usually used on the cuffs particularly in areas from the islands so on mittens and gloves 
but it's quite fun to use them on larger projects. So this is the Divod shawl. So it's using the fringe to kind of break up a classic shawl with some stripes. So you've got mindless areas of stock in it and then loads of these stripes of fringe in one and then two colors. So this looks fun. like it's done with a pearl to do. So the... it's kind of like a pearl. You're basically almost doing a pearl stitch, but you're wrapping your fringe yarn around a stitch to make like a pearl bump. Okay. And you need to use basically a stick <laughs> to keep your loops even. You're making loops for your fringe. Oh, right. Um, it sounds very odd, but it's a very effective technique and it's a lot easier. I can see sense. this technique being used in all kinds of styles. It's very addictive. When I started doing this for the book, I just wanted to put fringe on absolutely yeah. everything. You could put fringe on little collars, yeah. on, on <laughs> lapels. I was thinking you lapels. could get a cowboy yeah. look. <laughs> yes. And you can do them in multiple colors. So I've got in some places where you use both colors on the yeah. same row. Yeah, great. Okay, good. So then we have... What have we got next? We've got braids. Um, I quite like braids. So this is the Dulyak sweater. So you've just got braids and color work on the kind of the lower part of the body and the lower part of the sleeves. This uses two styles of knitted braids. There are loads of them, but I've just put in two in the book. So this uses the Gihnovitz or the Gihno braid. So from the island of Gihno and then the twisted braid, which I kind of call as the cousin to the Latvian braid, so the next door neighbor. Um, slightly similar look to that, so it's a little bit of a bigger braid. And braids, I think they're just lovely dividers or transitions between different stitch patterns. That's how they have been used, usually on traditional fishermen's sweaters or the cuffs of mittens because they prevent curling. So instead of doing lots of ribbing, which we're used to doing for our projects, mm -hmm. so you don't have curling hems or cuffs, mm. you can stick a braid on there and it That's great. So if we put it down here so we can see, yes. point out the two different braids. So the smaller braid is, so I've got up here at the top, that is the Gehnovitz. So it's done over two rows or rounds of knitting. And then the twisted braid, it sits a little bit bigger, a little wider. So I've got in the middle here is also done over two rows or rounds of knitting, but you're twisting two different directions. So you're doing a lot of twisting your yarn. There's a bit of tangling going on, but it is worth, it's okay. worth it. <laughs> and here you've got the fatter one with the two thin ones on either side. Yes. And is this somehow inspired by or connected to this traditional belt? Yes, so I basically took the belt pattern. So all the national costumes have belts. They coordinate in patterns to the outfit. And I use that to kind of inspire the color work, but breaking up sections that you usually see in pots of color with the braids. So you get a little bit of raised texture to it. And braids are really lovely to stack so you get different types of stripes, so a raised textured stripe. It's a really nice added special detail to a project. Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. And the colors here look quite traditional in a way. You've got this salmon bright pink. Was yeah. that, is that meant to be traditionally inspired? So some of the colors in the book, they are traditionally inspired but with a twist. So the colors in here, they're actually a lot of them neons, but they've been softened down with kind of a marling effect so I carried a natural color with it so it just takes okay. it down a bit but they're similar to a traditional color but just heightened here there so a bit brighter or muted in some patterns yeah great okay and then I I find this a fantastic use of, of noops or however you say them but yes. it looks fantastic on a jumper it does so so, just talk about that technique yeah so the most well-known stitch, I think, outside of Australia is the nup or nupud in Australian, um, which is a bobble stitch, and it translates roughly to a button or a flower bud. So it creates the look of that kind of item. And it's usually used in lace work, so nice, very delicate lace shawls. But I think it adds a really nice bit of texture, so taking out all the yarn overs and the openness and using it on a sweater... Now, nupu, they're always used to create shapes, even in lace work. So 
You're kind of making shapes that you would with color work knitting, but using bobbles to make those patterns. So this is creating crosses just repeated over and over again. But it, adds, it lets those bobbles really shine. It's beautiful. <laughs> I, I really like this design. It's subtle. So what is the technique? How is the technique done? So it's done, you can do this in the round or flat. Mm -hmm. And basically you're making multiple stitches out of one stitch always an odd number so anywhere between traditionally it was five to seven stitches I've done it I think on one pattern in the book up to 13 stitches <laughs> with some mohair and you're basically doing yarn over knit yarn over knit in one stitch and then when you come back around on the following row around you decrease back to one so you've got to pull all the stitches together and a knit to knit seven five together or purl five seven together okay because so. it looks quite like a satin stitch in a way yes it reminds me of a satin stitch in embroidery just yes. sort of smooth and yeah, yeah they're a little bit smooth smaller bobbles than kind of like the big chunky ones you yeah. might see so they're really nice for creating shapes and patterns with because it has that soft roundness so how many designs in the book there are 20 designs. One is actually, you could say 19. One is a sweater and dress version of the same pattern. A um, mix of small to large projects. So you can do something small, quick and easy to get started up to larger cardigan dress sweater patterns. A okay. little bit of something for everyone. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and you have knitted, you have taught these techniques in workshops and uh, knitters picking them up easily? Yes, so I call all the techniques in here deceptively easy. They look a lot harder than they are, so do not be afraid to try them. <laughs> They're okay. really not that hard to do. Good. Now, there are two extra designs that I really want the viewers to see because they're not included in this book, but I think you'll love to see them. So let's start off with the gnome. <laughs> sure. So this He does have a bit of traditional technique yes. in him. Yes, so I started the gnome off, so... The first of the gnomes is called Knit Gnome, which I had done as an illustration and then decided to translate into knit form. And it was just such fun and a success. So I've now started doing gnomes using the different techniques that I teach and design with. So this is Rosy Gnome, who has a bit of Rosy Mina on his hat and then just a little bit of braids on the bottom and the brim, which is the Kichnovitz, just so if you want a little bit of a fun whimsical super quick knit that's not a nup is it no <laughs> i almost there's a there will be one with a nup, nup so i'm yeah. gonna do one with a fringe hopefully for this year um but they're really fun to kind of get to grips with the project exactly. if you want something cute yeah. to just gift. to try out little bits yeah. of all the techniques and then you can start on a bigger project yeah. okay so that's your gnome we'll put him there <laughs> And then this stunning design here. So tell us about this one. So this one is called Riste. And I'm showing you can say Riste as well, which means crossroads. And this was kind of me exploring, combining different stitch patterns. So we've got twisted stitches with stranded color work. So it gives the look of a quilting effect. So I've started off with a vertical chevron pattern and I filled those chevrons with either twisted stitches or a stranded color work pattern that I took inspiration from some traditional work. So collaging them to create this beautiful effect and a classic yoke jumper. Yeah, it is It is really exceptional. It stands up beautifully. Yeah. Now there was one more technique that we didn't talk about and that's over here, that's the twisted stitches. That's quite well known outside of Estonian technique, yeah. but it is a, a technique that's used a lot, isn't yes. it? Yes, so this in Estonian we call it a vikal stitch. So this is doing cable-like patterns without the use of a cable needle and you can cross your stitches over knits and purl stitches so this is doing it over knits and purls so you've got basically a reverse stockinette background and it lets those kind of cable-like patterns really shine. So where would this have traditionally been used? They have been traditionally used mostly on the islands so actually the largest island in Estonia so Saarema usually on a white background. Um, I've played around with colours for the book and the designs that I do and it would be an all-over pattern on the glove. 
And would it be used stuffing. for a wedding glove or something yes, really important? special occasion. So yeah. really crisp, crisp white, um, high knee length stockings along the legs as well as the back of the hand. So really special occasion, not something you're gardening or doing, kind of wandering around in. Going down to do your grocery <laughs> <No>. shopping. <laughs> you could. <laughs> okay. Now, before we finish the interview, I want to talk about your illustrations. Yes. Because you studied illustration at uni in New York, and apart from designing knitwear, you're also getting a name for yourself as an illustrator in the hand knitting world. So just say something very brief about your studies, and then can you show us some examples of, of your course. works? So I studied graphic design and illustration at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. And there I started kind of trying to combine my loves of hand knitting and illustration. So that came about in my most famous and popular series, which are the Knitster Girls, of documenting my stories, knitting, as well as my friends and knit groups, of always trying to find that perfect fit with our knitwear. And the best way of doing that, in a fun, humorous way, is basically knitting our projects onto ourselves. So knitting your sweaters on, your socks, um, but in a really fun way and kind of humorous of let me knit my turtleneck all the way to covering my head. Um, <laughs> There. So yeah, so okay, they're great. They're really they're gorgeous <laughs> designs, and you've done it for logos for people's business too, haven't yes, you? Yes, so I've done a few logos for knitting festivals as well, and a couple of yarn businesses. Just kind of bringing in a bit of whimsical humor, and kind of translating knitted stitches into beautiful painted stitches. So, what techniques are you using here as an illustrator? How what is the medium? So it's a bit of a mix. So these were done, this is an original done by hand, so using inks and basically almost like a quill and just making each and every stitch almost like I was knitting, but just painting each one. I also do a lot, so commission work digitally, but it always starts on paper and then moves over to basically a digital screen that I can physically draw on okay so yeah. you're a real physical yes yeah. I like everything like knitting I like the tangible it always has to start there for me what happens if you make a mistake <laughs> <laughs> when it's an ink you kind of have to work with it okay. um digital obviously you can always undo yeah. undo yeah. um with that you kind of have to get into the zone and just go with it um usually I mark out the shapes and then start making stitches very um, meticulously meticulous so kind of working row by row by row just as if okay. I was actually so knitting. actually this is very special yes <laughs> that's a special Each original has been hand painted like mm -hmm. hand knitted yeah okay <laughs> Excellent. Well, this has been a really fun interview. It's been fantastic to have you on Fruity Knitting, so I really appreciate you coming. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Good. <laughs> Let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. Yeah, 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 yeah